Today, I want to talk about San Diego State University's use of NRP Nautilus for instruction. Um, I met some of you, but my name is Mike Farley, Chief Technology Research Officer at San Diego State. I've been there about 15 years and 23 years in higher ed IT, but mainly on the enterprise side. So really focusing for the past two years on research, which has been um, super exciting to say the least. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about SDSU. We're not South Dakota State University, but um, that does come up quite a bit. Um, some of the work that we've done in the AI space, non-computational work, I should say, um, and then tell you about our journey of using Nautilus for instruction. So San Diego State, you heard this some yesterday from um, Bing Bing, is one of 23 campuses within the California State University system. Um, and thank you, Ed Clark. I think he's here, our, our system CIO. I appreciate him coming out for this talk. Uh, San Diego State has about 36,000 students, uh, but we receive 109,000 applications a year, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, our students are pretty much spread out among our various colleges, not any, I don't know, business is actually a little bigger, but they are, they are spread out quite a bit. Since 2020, we have been, I guess, operating under a strate new strategic plan, and one of the focus areas in that plan is to become a premier HSI-serving R1 research institution. Um, and I think looking at the Carnegie classification, 2025, I think we will be there. Uh, we do about 200 million in external grant funding per year. So back in October of last year, we administered a AI student survey. So this went out to those 36,000 students and got a tremendous response rate, over 20%. Um, if you've ever sent out a survey to a large group of people, you'll know that 20% is extremely high. I will say there were uh, gift cards involved that I think helped push that up a little bit. Um, I, I won't go into the survey much, but there's some links here you'll, you can get to after the fact. But we, you know, there were a couple of uh, five thematic areas in that survey, but a couple just high level takeaways. 86% um, uh, say that AI will become essential to most professions. I think that's really telling. 51% uh, are using AI in their coursework, which is a lot higher than I expected. And then 34% of instructors encourage the use of AI coursework. Um, the survey results, actually, I think the draft article was accepted this week, so we'll update that link hopefully um, this week if you're interested in it. I believe actually we've got about 12 other campuses within the CSU that are adopting this, University of Hawaii as well. Several other institutions are gonna be um, using this survey. It is open source, if that's the right word, so feel free to adopt it. The instrument is freely available. With that, we created a AI micro-credential. This was geared towards faculty. So this launched in January of this year. Uh, this was really to introduce faculty to generative AI, so the terminologies, like what is a GPT actually, uh, prompt engineering, um, ethics, responsible use of AI. A couple of the takeaways for faculty were to actually craft a uh, statement to put in their syllabi on the use of AI. So those, those students um, would have a better idea of whether they should be using it or not using it. And we had about 600 people sign up for this. Okay, so transitioning a little bit and talking about our use of NRP Nautilus for instruction. So where did we start? Uh, very interesting, we started with a committee, which is probably never the best way to start anything, um, but we created a cyber infrastructure committee and we actually called it that. And as Katie said yesterday, nobody knows what cyber infrastructure means outside of the NSF and probably a lot of us in this room. So first takeaway, probably don't call it that. Uh, this was chaired or co-chaired by our former CIO, Jerry Sheehan, who is joining remotely today, as well as our VPR, uh, Hala, from the university. It was really faculty-led, so we brought, we brought in faculty representatives, or had the deans represent faculty from each college in all of our campuses. So we started off, first off, defining cyber infrastructure, uh, which was the number one step there, and really sent them back to their colleges, to their departments, to survey their colleagues and what they need in the cyber infrastructure space, compute, networking, storage. This didn't start with instruction. We didn't ask them to focus on instruction. It was really just cyber infrastructure in general. We got the data back, and there were really three clustered areas, uh, Jupyter, Hub, Notebook, Lab, high-performance computing, things bigger than their laptop, 
and GPUs. So we were like, hmm, that's interesting. So I sent an email to Adam. Hey, Adam, this is Mike Farley. You've never met me before. Would you like to join a committee meeting? And um, Adam was gracious enough to join. So he actually joined and presented on the data science machine learning platform. So with that, going back to uh, Frank yesterday and that horizontal uh, scale of Nautilus, the bring your own resource model, um, Jerry had worked, has worked with um, Tom and Larry for quite a while, so he knew about NRP Nautilus. And we thought, well, those three things seem like a natural fit for Nautilus. Um, the big one for us being a uh, really understaffed university, we do not have that high performance computing experience. So the ability for the NRP staff to provide that administration was really key to our selection of, of that. One area we needed to address um, was our networking, and specifically a science DMZ. We didn't really have anything appropriate for this instructional, potential instructional usage um, there. So um, I don't know if anyone, or hopefully everybody's met Jason if you're from Epic over here. I think everyone probably knows him. Um, so we reached out to Jason. This was a bit unrelated to this particular use case, but we had another, um, we had another uh, science driver that really had network as a key component of it. And Epic does application deep dives, deep dives, if you don't know. So Jason came on site along with Doug, and we kind of dug into the, the use case, understand the data transfer and everything that went behind it. As part of that, we did a holistic view of the network at San Diego State, which he provided some recommendations on. So we were able to go, OK, well, we've actually in a really great position to build out a science DMZ for this particular instructional use case. We just did a campus refresh. We had a very decent router switching equipment still supported. We actually had extra connections from Scenic for HPR, which doesn't happen very often. So we were able to repurpose that um, for this particular use case. What we have isn't perfect, but we are planning to upgrade the connectivity and hardware later this year. So with that, we um, wrote up a proposal um, based off the faculty recommendations, based off what we knew about NRP Nautilus and received funding um, actually from the president. So this went to the president's budget advisory committee. We had proposed, um, we actually ended up well, I won't get into the, the money figures, but in the end, we ended up receiving about 15, money to fund 15 servers, CPU, GPU, and storage. Uh, the easy button, that's, Larry mentioned that, Valerie, I think you mentioned it too, but for us, yes, Jupyter Hub is the easy button um, for this particular thing. We have about 422, as of this morning, users of Jupyter Hub. We maintain, much like San Bernardino, a research and an instructional Jupyter Hub, just with different settings and limits on the capacity. We've provided, um, we, we use all of the NRP container images, but we've also created a bunch of our own. So Vern is what we call it, and we actually worked backwards from Vern. Does anyone get the literary uh, connection between Vern and NRP? I see a couple smiles. This was a Jerry thing, I wish he was here. But um, if you don't know, uh, uh, think of uh, 20,000 leagues under the sea and, and Nautilus and Julius Vern, but um, that that's, how we came up with that. And it was a chat GPT thing, by the way. <laughs> so to support this, um, we have a, we, well, we started off two years ago with nobody. So I, I started back at San Diego State in this position two years ago and have been building out a team. So relatively small team. Uh, so to support the, the creation of containers, the support of um, the instructional use case especially, we created the software factory. And this is really a, a student-centric. So much like um, Valerie and Adam said, we're employing our students to be part of our team and work on real things. Um, the idea being it's, you know, for them, they're, they're learning tools, DevOps practices, uh, how to create container images. Uh, we use GitHub. I know GitLab is part of Nautilus, but we really want them to take that commit history with them, be able to put that on their resume. So they work closely with our research software engineers, both Kyle and Henry are here in the front. And they, they build containers, and that's really our on-ramp to Vern for uh, instructional as well as research usage. You guys are gonna have to humor us. We actually have a little short video here. Um, I wanted to illustrate one of our, our students and one of the faculty we're working with. So let me see if I can start this.
SDSU's Vern cluster was envisioned after surveying our faculty's cyber infrastructure needs. High performance computing with access to Jupyter Hub and graphical processing units were areas our faculty identified as desired. Thanks to an investment by the university, we were able to obtain hardware to join the National Research Platform's Nautilus cluster, with an initial focus on instruction, but able to expand and support research. With our small team, we really wanted to focus on enabling the use of the platform. So having the National Research Platform team manage the cluster frees up our time to focus on enabling its use. To support faculty and the use of software containers, we created the Software Factory, staffed by students and research software engineers. The goal is to teach our Software Factory student assistants DevOps practices, focusing on CI CD pipelines, source control, and software containerization. Through the Software Factory, our student assistants learn critical skills that they can take with them when they graduate. Using the skills that they learn, student assistants support instructional needs, which is a win-win for them and for our faculty. As students apply what they are learning, and faculty benefit from the hands-on support. The Software Factory focuses on leveraging software containers, which are like reusable building blocks. Containers really shine in the instructional setting because they provide students and faculty with the same environment, saving time and headache from trying to get on the same page. Often we can meet a majority of the software needs for an instruction or research setting with an existing container. However, some academic disciplines require niche software libraries and tools. The Software Factory student assistants help by engaging faculty to understand their needs and building custom containers to satisfy their requirements. This process provides our students with real world experience that is hard to come by through coursework alone. Supporting Vern has taught me many real world technical skills including CI CD pipelines, containerization, and source control. Applying these skills in support of our faculty and their instructional needs gives meaning to the work, knowing these are some of the same courses I may be taking. It's also driving my interest in AI and ML, laying the groundwork for potential internships or job opportunities down the road, as I deepen my understanding of these tools and infrastructure that enable these applications at scale. Vern has been great for instruction and my research. Being able to provide students with access to advanced resources, including GPUs from any web browser is a great benefit to instruction. These are resources that may not be otherwise available or out of reach for a single course here at SDSU. I have expanded my use of Vern for an NIH funded project where we are looking at understanding COPD by looking at development of the lungs and how that affects susceptibility to COPD later on in life. The software factory engagement style and support makes using Venn easy, and I look forward to using Venn for future courses. Our hope is that Vern continues to improve based on feedback. For us, Vern and the National Research Platform represent a real game changer in democratizing access to advanced cyber infrastructure for our students and faculty. With the lessons learned, we plan to apply a similar approach to our research software needs. Seeing yourself that your head that big on the monitor is a bit disturbing, but um, so looking at our course usage, uh, and thank you, Kyle, for helping out with that. Um, I didn't show you a graph like this, but we started off very small um, pur purposely. We started off with three courses back in spring of 2023. And I'll be honest, we had all kinds of problems with storage and networking. So I was glad we only had 50 some students that were trying to use this. Uh, we did fix that. And for fall and then now spring, we've got about 14 courses and 300 students using it. The growth has been very organic. We have not been pushing the use just because we didn't know if we could support it or not. Um, but we have attended a few department meetings and mainly it's just been word of mouth. Um, and we have repeat people. I'm happy to say the three professors using it in 23 who had all kinds of problems are using it today. So we, we did uh, keep them as customers. Uh, not surprisingly, the for us, it's mainly STEM courses listed here. Um, I think that's probably just due to us not doing some work and going to those other department meetings. And I think the list that UCSD has provided, I think is a good example of some of those areas we could focus on and, and follow up with. Uh, one example, this is a new course, uh, MIS 429 Artificial Intelligence. And 
Um, Dr. Aaron Elkins teaches this, and I'm not going to say it as eloquently as he did, but he basically is flying by the seat of his pants in this one. Uh, based on what's happening in the AI ML space is exactly what he teaches that week in the course. They were doing some prompt engineering, wanted to use Python, OpenAI, API, but not leverage uh, commercial utilities. So we were able to deploy fast chat, which was used in the demo yesterday for him. One, uh, I guess, theme here is instruction is leading to research. So Dr. Alkins is the director of the James Silver Brown Center for Artificial Intelligence. They focus on many different areas, um, uh, robotics, lots of stuff with large language models, human computer interaction. Um, and recently they've kind of grown out of their hardware that they had already purchased, specifically out of GPUs. So we said, hey, um, we can help you with that. And two members of his team um, are here. So we're working with them to do some or while they're working, we're working to facilitate their access, but they're working on um, model training, fine tuning, and hosting. You saw Dr. Udawak George in the video, and she mentioned they are using um, National Research Platform Nautilus for some uh, COPD machine learning models that they're working to create. This is a NIH AIM AHEAD pair, I think that's it, funded project. So what have we learned? Um, containers are not easy. Our software factory helps. Uh, utilize what's already there. There's already great containers that have already been built. We use all of those base containers. Um, that's probably about 50% of our usage at this point. Uh, Nautilus is a research resource, so it's not up 24-7. Look at the Ceph issues we had last week. If you've got a course and you've got homework due and it's down for three days, people are gonna be knocking on your door, but something to consider. Growth is slow, but it has been steady. So I think going into this, we expected a lot more usage, um, but I, I think it's, it's the line's moving up, which is good. Not everyone needs GPUs. A lot of people come to us and need a GPU, and then you dig in and what are you doing? What type of software? Um, and turns out a lot of people do not actually need GPUs yet, but it's good that they're hearing about it and they're thinking how it can improve uh, the work that they're doing. Support, you know, with uh, 300 students, 14 courses, just a very small team, we were not expecting the support to be as little as it is. Uh, we receive very few requests when things are working, which they have about for the past year. Um, we do a ticketing system, but overall, we probably receive maybe one request every other week as far as problems go, which is not bad at all. And then really, finally, uh, better together. I think the NRP community is the real secret here. Um, I think we're extremely happy to be part of this community. Um, and I think I'd love to lean into this a little more and see what we could do and maybe create some communities to talk about this stuff outside of this meeting once a year, because I think there's some real opportunity there. And I guess this would be my finally, finally slide. Um, just if, if you're not using it today, you know what can you do? How can you? get started. And I think definitely talk to Jason if you have any networking or science drivers that require networking. He was very helpful there. And that's all I have. Questions to either. So this one will be for Valerie. <laughs> all right. And I'm going to give a little background when she gets up there because uh, this takes some context. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Valerie Polachar was one of the leads on the development of NGN, the next generation network model here, which involved figuring out how to um, charge grants and other mechanisms to drive the network capacity on campus. So Valerie knows how to both bring people together and address barriers like some of the policies and financial hurdles. Um, the other piece of information to know is that I'm the CTO for SDSC, Rick Wagner. I work for Frank, but up until October 1st, I work for Claire, who works for Valerie. So Valerie is who I used to refer to as grand boss. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so Valerie, let's suppose I'm an optimist. And I would love to see a singular system that takes the DSMLP and turns it into a scalable resource for both research um, and instructional use. And I see some organizational barriers to that and some financial barriers to that. Organizationally, we at SDSC operate things like TSCC, our condo cluster. We support the researchers a lot. You know, ITS supports instruction and other business capabilities financially. There's a color of money issue so that, you know, the funds for education can't necessarily go towards research. Well, sometimes research funds can. So 
if you're an optimist, how would you consider tackling some of these organizational and financial barriers that we have? So the color of money problem is not as bad as it used to be because University of California used to dole out uh, instructional use in computing funds, which had to be used for instruction only. Now it's kind of all core funds. So we do have the difference between core and grant funds, and um, we do have to be a little careful there, but we don't have quite the same restriction that you, you can't use the instructional side for the research. Um, what's very important, what uh, I think most of our funding agencies care about is that if, if they're giving funding to a lab to support the services and the, the functions of that research, um, that, that lab has to get those services and functions. Um, so that is the, that's where we have to keep the lines very bright and clear. But it doesn't mean that we cannot take advantage, for example, of having system administrators that might serve both sides, that we might have um, some base hardware or base infrastructure that can serve both needs, as long as we make sure that that lab gets everything that they have paid for. So that's a piece of it. I think, you know, we are trying to, uh, for our part, because we have SDSC's resources here, we don't need to reinvent them. So we're trying to keep things um, to that, that missing piece of what do I do if I'm a history professor and I don't have any grant funding and I just I, I need to do some text analysis and I've got I, I've heard that I should use these particular tools but you know I can't use them on my laptop um, we're trying to fill that that gap and so I think by carefully carving that out and also by taking advantage where we can share you know the 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 real message of the NRP is that was what you can do when you share an architecture, when you can you share what you can. And I think that's I think that's relevant here. Thank yeah, thank you, um, Frank. This is a question for Michael from uh, not S South Dakota State. <laughs> um, uh, so I love your idea of this software factory um, and having, you know, students um, out front on that. My question is, um, where do these students come from? How do you find them? Um, and, and, you know, I've run labs where, where we had a student pipeline and it was really great, but I, I always seem to be kind of scrambling to fill that next position. It seemed like as soon as I trained one and they were really great at their job, they were off to other better things. So, um, what does your pipeline look like and, and where do you find these students? That's a very good question. I don't think we've been doing this long enough where I could easily or truthfully answer that. I think we've been lucky with the computer science students that we have. Um, I kind of skipped over it, but w one of the things that's helped is we're, we do a faculty fellowship in my groups. So we buy out faculty's time, a couple of them per year. And they become great resources within the college or departments and give us referrals, both students and um, other faculty. So that's something I would probably lean on more in the future. Great, thank you. Any other questions? So it's for both both institutions. I think, uh, and someone alluded to this a little bit, I think there's been a big uh, push for a lot of the administrative services to move into the cloud, especially for these things that are very elastic, registration, things like that. Um, is there anything beyond money that made you decide to do it locally? I mean, a lot of places do just push, well, we're going to move everything to the cloud. That's an interesting question. Um, I think some of what <laughs> we have learned as we have gone along that there's been some benefits to having things in-house um, that perhaps, you know, if we'd had infinite money, we'd never get a, a chance to learn. Um, I, 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 Adam, you might have some things to add to this. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to say this very thoroughly, but um, we there is there are learning experiences with um, touching things hands on, um, with building things hands on. There are collaborative uh, opportunities because you're working with real hardware and you can you can trade, you can help each other out when you're in a pinch, right? Um, I think 
also, uh, and this doesn't really just apply to this particular effort, but to our broader instructional innovation efforts. We have faculty coming to us all the time with a new idea. And sometimes the new idea can be built on the back of what you already have if you have it there physically. And you can say, I'm gonna reconfigure this to, to meet this need. Um, examples here at UCSD, we have a Raspberry Pi cluster because a faculty member said, I really need to teach a class with a Raspberry Pi cluster. I've got, I, I wanna do a bare metal uh, class, I need, need that. And um, I think that our, our research cluster, which is kind of stapled onto the back of, of, the, of, uh, of our instructional cluster, um, part, it started with a Fiona box that, um, or two maybe, that Claire's team had and managed and we were able to bring that together. So I, I, w I would say that there's, there's affordances that you get from having it in-house that are also valuable. Um, but yes, also the cloud is, wouldn't be affordable for us. As you can see, we, we built this with what my finance director likes to call budget fairy dust. Um, you can't do that with the cloud yet. <laughs> Did you want to add? Yeah, just add one thing. Yeah, just to add to that a little bit, um, I think by purchasing the equipment, we have uh, we, we have established a maximum cost. We we it is it is a capital expense, and then it's on us to make the best use of it that we can. And I think in many areas, uh, especially here at UCSD, uh, there is much more scrutiny on the allocation of dollars. Um, I had to fill out a uh, a uh, budget information form for a six dollar a month charge, and that that took more effort uh, than it did to set up a, a brand new class on DSMLP. And I, I think the uh, the overhead in making those microtransactions in a university setting, uh, I think really uh, argues against the cloud model unless somebody up at the top is, is willing to take some very large risks uh, in uh, you know opening up a piggy bank uh, for those users. I'd probably add the clouds definitely has some advantages to keeping hardware current. You know, always having access to up to date GPUs is nice, but the cap op, cap X OPEX conversation, it's really hard to justify using the cloud. And I actually worked at Amazon Web Services, so I won't go too deep into that. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I think the community too, being able to talk to this community and meet and talk about this, I think is also I'll just kind of reinforce that point ahead up. Okay, thank you guys. I wanted to add one more answer to you. And I think that both of these have shown that there's another reason why doing it at home has an advantage, and that's the student involvement. And the, at SCC, we've uh, started a few years ago a program where we've basically asked ourselves, what are the jobs that we need to hire in? And why don't we use the captive audience of 42,000 students to recruit from for the jobs that we actually need to hire in rather than opening it up, just taking people from the street. And that's actually become a very productive and very successful program. It has multiple, it hits multiple points. It gives the students an education, which is very important, and a skill set that they go out into industry with. And occasionally, we get somebody to hire that then just stays on. And that's also a very valuable thing. And so I think that having stuff in house and involvement with students at a significant and a scale is actually really, really valuable. And that was actually my question because I, I you know, these skills are, uh, create new career pathways for the next generation. And so I wanted to find out if you've actually hired um, any of the students. We have. We, we just um, brought on one of our students into an open full-time position when, when somebody else moved up. So, um, yes, we have, we have done that and we hope to do many more. Well, we've just been doing it a year, but no, but uh, Kyle works at San Diego State and he started out as a student. So we're very proud of that. We lean into that quite a bit at SDSU. So I've got two things to say, one of which I want to be the last, um, is um, the amount of money that you're putting into this $75,000 a year, that's what one graduate student costs us. 
you know how many graduate students we have on this campus? It's just, you know, it seems like a lot of money, but when you think about the rest of the enterprise. Um, I talked to Vince yesterday afternoon because he has been the most powerful person on this campus to get people to use the cloud. He got the campus to drop the overhead on cloud services. We and the University of Washington are the only people who do that. That's a 58% tax if you use the cloud. But Vince bought all these H100s. And I said to him, uh, why did you do H100? Why did you buy them when you, you know, you're the cloud guy? And he said, because the cloud screws us for GPUs. It, the GPUs are too expensive on the cloud. They're okay for you know, the administrative stuff we do, but for the, for the GPUs, it doesn't work. And that's true. That's every time we go over, depending on how you cook the books, it's between four and 10% cheaper to have on-prem GPUs. So with that changes, we'll find out. 